one two one two you know how we do with your boy bq and this here at the impact lounge is episode number one of power moves it's my new podcast covering nwa power super excited for this show and i haven't been this excited about a wrestling show in a long time i was super excited back in 2016 when um, impact debuted on pop that's probably, you know, actually the most excited I've been for a show in a while because I was expecting a new era, new movement back then, and that, that didn't happen. Um, but all the way up till now, this is probably the most excited I've been to for a show. For something, I knew something different was coming, and when, when Billy Corgan was part of TNA, I liked what he brought. I liked his ideas. I liked his eye for talent. But he was always held back a little. We know that with Dixie. And there was a point where we thought he was going to take over TNA. That didn't happen. And you can see with this NWA roster, there's several workers here on the roster that you can tell these were Billy Corgan favorites. And he, you know, he brought people over that, or recruited people, I should say, that obviously can talk on the mic. There were people who, when they had their mic time on, on Impact, they did an excellent job. So NWA Power, yesterday was my birthday, and uh, at first I was not going to watch it because I was trying to celebrate with my family, but I said, you know what, I have to watch it, it's just an hour, let's push dinner off, let's check out Power. And I can say, without bullshitting you, that I love this. It was an easy watch, it was an hour, I actually thought it was two but uh, I caught a tweet earlier in the day, said it was an hour. And I said, you know what, that's cool. And then I thought about, well, they got kind of a lot of people on that roster. How are they going to fit them in? And what, what is, you know, how effective is the util- utilization of all these wrestlers going to be? So I was really intrigued. And for my longtime listeners, I'm a sucker for great marketing. I've passionately studied marketing for years. And everything NWA has done since Billy Corgan came on board was top-notch in my opinion. What they have done with Twitter, the 10 Pounds of Gold series on YouTube, they could have just posted a bunch of old NWA matches for the last three years. They could have just built their YouTube off that. And they said, you know what, we're going to make the NWA title the sole focus for however long they did. Tim Storm was a champion for a long time, and then Nick Aldis got it, and then Cody, and, and then Nick Aldis again. And they've, they've managed to have like really compelling angles and storylines, despite it just being a traveling belt. I had the opportunity to see an NWA championship match. A tried and true pro. Nick Aldis defended against Crimson. So I actually got to be around for one. I got to see one in person. So I was invested in what this was going to do because I was impressed in, in how, despite not having a real promotion, they were just able to make this title seem really special. And you, you take Nick Aldis, okay? When he was Magnus... In TNA. Yeah, he had a world title run. When they brought him back over the Global Force Wrestling umbrella. And he was the GFW champion. He didn't feel... They tried to make him feel special first. They, It lasted like one episode. They couldn't, they couldn't do it. They didn't know how to do it. And... You know, they had him around for a little while. And he was just... He was just Magnus. Like, he... He, he, he went from... At first, they were like, okay, we're gonna we're beefing up the heavyweight title scene, the main event scene. And then he, he went to doing nothing, you know? And then he wasn't even on the pay-per-view card, and then he, then he left. And I don't know exactly what happened. I know it wasn't the best of terms, and I know he, um, he said he was never signed. He was just there to drop the title, whatever, you know? But you take what the NWA has done with him, he seems like a real big deal. Anyone who's held the title, they've made him seem like a big deal. They made Tim Storm seem like a big deal. 
You know what I mean? And, and, and to a lot of people, he was kind of an unknown. And people, or even if he wasn't an unknown, people, you know, I saw it a lot of the time on social media. Like, where this is who you're choosing to put the title on? Why not? You know? Um, they had a match on Facebook that they streamed about a year, I don't know, maybe a year ago or so. Whereas Nick Aldis versus Tim Storm and is on Hollywood Championship Wrestling, I believe. And the, the, the match wasn't, in my opinion, and really the opinion of many people wasn't that good. But it did strike my intrigue. I don't know. I remember the finish being a little wonky, coming off a little flat. I, I don't have too many memories about it. And that, that was the only time I was like, oh, man, maybe maybe they don't know what they're doing with this. But everything since then has been really good. They got their Twitter game down. Like, if you if you look at their Twitter, they know how to work Twitter properly. Even the, just the, the marketing tactics of tag for three friends who need to see this show tonight. The last that I looked, this show had 127,000 views at the 19-hour mark. And they gained about over 15, I think like 17,000 subscribers from what I saw on YouTube in a single day. So to me, the show was a success. That's that's the first show. But I've, I've seen nothing, heard nothing but good from it. So I want to do this podcast, Power Moves, and I don't even know how I'm going to deliver the podcast from week to week because I have more to obviously talk about today since it was the first show. You know, so, you know, going forward, they might be shorter shows. I don't really know yet. But some of the first things I noticed about Power, there's obviously the retro feel, the 70s, 80s, whatever they're going for. I was born in 79, so I don't exactly, I didn't quite grow up off that era, so I, I, I don't know what time frame it is that they're going for. But they achieved it. <laughs> I know that much. I noticed the camera angles were, were zoomed up more on the ring. So the wrestlers on the screen looked larger than life. You know, that's a, that's a term we've used for wrestlers, especially if you, you know, around my age and we grew up a certain time where WWF was really hot. And the wrestlers seem like superheroes. You know, they just look like monsters on TV. And now, you know, most most cameras are kind of zoomed out a little. Guys look small. Guys are small. So I watched the first match on my phone. And then after that, I, I signed off for a bit. And then I I put it on my Roku on, on the TV. You know, it's got a nice HD look and everything. It looks good. But that's when it really caught me. That's when that's when I noticed. I was like, man, the, the wrestlers. I, I turned it on. Um, I started watching. It was the Eli Drake and Caleb Conley match. I was like, dude, they look huge. And uh, especially, you know, Caleb Conley, who's, I would imagine, an average size guy. Um, maybe he's 5'10". I don't know. He, he looked pretty big, too. So right away, that was the first thing I noticed. A very larger-than-life feel. Because when you're watching wrestling, you shouldn't be... You shouldn't feel like you're in the ring or your next door neighbor's in the ring. And I feel like that's kind of what we're getting to a little bit. So even the smaller guys look, they just look bigger and more, more imposing on TV. I can see that promos are going to matter. And I saw where Billy Corgan had said, you know, we, we were looking for that next like Dusty Rhodes promo. And the promos are, are they're, they're short, they're passionate, they're real, they're emotional, they're from the heart. They're not scripted. They're not funny or an attempt to be funny. Even Eli Drake's promo, which had humor, if you know how Eli Drake delivers his shit, it was funny, but it like he doesn't even say dummy. He just says, yeah. So, but he's a funny guy. So, that's, so he can get away with it. You know what I mean? But oftentimes in wrestling, people are cutting promos. And people who are not funny try to be funny or writers try to make them funny. And this really like played off on their personalities really well. And what's lost in today's promo, I really truly feel where the promo went downhill in wrestling was when they, this is WWE's fault, when they put a wrestler in the ring with a microphone by himself, his or herself, or there's two workers in there and they're, going back and forth when you had the days of i mean the days of god forever 
All right, you have a backstage guy, or even you have a guy in the ring. Like you know, WWF used to do some stuff with Mean Gene in the ring. And when you have someone that's just holding that, that's such a small detail, but holding that microphone, and oftentimes carrying the the interview, you know, you might have someone who's not really good on the mic, but some you know a good backstage interview can kind of kind of guide things. So the promos matter. They obviously matter here. And the promos we did hear from like someone like Thomas Latimer, who's Bram and TNA, like what, what memorable promo did he ever cut in TNA? And I'm not saying what he did here was memorable, but it meant something. He walked on, there's the tag team champion and he was, you know, full of piss and vinegar. He was yelling what he said meant something. You felt it. But I really truly feel that we got away from the good promos when you when you counted on the wrestler to do too much, especially when you put him out in the ring. Like when you have him in a smaller, intimate setting, promos, interviews, whatever, they always come out come off way better. It's like me cutting this podcast right now. I'm in a room by myself. Uh, yeah, I got my cats walking around, and my daughter's in her room. My girlfriend's in her room, our room. But I'm but I'm by myself right now. If I were cutting this same program in the middle of a high school gymnasium with 500 people in there, do you think I'm going to speak with this same confidence and this same delivery, the same vocal tone, the same emotion? Fuck no. So promos, promos are going to matter. The other thing that looks like they want to matter are the stars, the wrestlers. Like you felt that wild card, that James Storm, that Eli Drake, that Tim Storm. It's funny they got two storms. Uh, usually, <laughs> usually in wrestling, they get away from that kind of thing. Tim Storm, uh, Nick Aldis. When they were on the screen, they felt like they mattered. And um, even Caleb Conley, even though he was kind of there to to lose, I felt more confident in him meaning something in this one match than anything he ever did in Impact. You know, because he was just treading water for a really long time. And then they put him with Trevor Lee. And it was kind of a comedy thing. So even though he lost, I don't feel like... I didn't get this vibe every time he comes on a TV screen, he's going to lose. You know what I mean? But but he, he helped make Eli Drake feel like a big deal. So you can see that they have the mentality of... the rest. Each wrestler is going to matter before we move on to the next one. You, you know what I mean? Like, you, you got to understand this guy's backstory and what makes him important, what makes him special. And when that happens, now we're going to, you know, you, they're not just throwing a bunch of people at you at once. And that was the same thing with the belt. They were just like, we're just going to make the belt matter again. doesn't matter who holds it. You know, they're going to have a good run with the title. You can't look back, you know, some of these guys and other companies that had title runs. Even Magnus, we're talking about Nick Aldis here. And look back at a title run and be like, oh, well, that was a flop, you know? Well, the company did him no favors. But they're actually getting that focus now as the champion. And uh, they want the titles to sound like they matter. Every champion who came on the screen, whether it's Wildcard, um, James Storm, or Nick Aldis, like someone was there who wanted their fucking belt. It wasn't a prop. Someone someone came out or someone was there. It's like, yo, that, shit, that shit's going to be mine. It seemed like they give a shit about the titles. But as I said, they want you to care, care about each wrestler before they start throwing a bunch of other people at They can't just, you know, throw a bunch of people at you at once. And that's what, you know, as cool as Lucha Underground was, I just felt like we were getting so many people so quickly, you know, with the exception of the main eventers. You know, there were some people who just, they you know, we, we couldn't learn enough about them. And their backstory quick enough because more people were coming on board. And then we see it in other companies. Someone debuts and, you know, we don't know their backstory. We don't know shit about them. Someone shows up to a wrestling promotion with makeup on, with face paint. Or that has some, obviously some kind of like gimmick to them. And we don't, we don't learn anything about them. So NWA has done a good job with whether it's a 10 pounds of gold series or what they were doing on the actual show or just whatever they do on their YouTube. Like we're learning about these wrestlers and and like even when Eli Drake went out there, you know, the first the the um you know, the guy interviewing him wasn't just like, "Oh, my guess at this time he's Eli Drake." Like they were like, "Hey, he's 
I've been with this guy. I've seen this guy from the beginning at Hollywood Championship Wrestling, and you know that like they give you something, some kind of backstory to work with. And they're gonna, not going to do it with everybody at once. They obviously didn't do it with Caleb Conley. And then they had a couple guys out there, you know, kind of serving as jobbers, whatever. But they didn't, you know, they didn't do that with them. But they, you know, they they knew who they were going to focus on to make them important. And then they hyped up Allison K for next week. You know, that's all they said. Hey, next week's going to be huge. We got Allison K coming. She's she's the women's champion, so she's she's a big deal. Made her feel that way. They're also okay with someone looking strong. There was well three squash matches on this. They were okay with that. In this era of 50-50 booking where, oh, someone has to look strong this week and then strong the next, and they don't want someone to look weak. Like, who cares? Who cares if the one of the main eventers goes out there one night and has a bad night and loses in three minutes? That's realistic. That's life. So I really feel like, you know, with some of those matches, everyone looks strong. But the people who are supposed to look strong look strong. It wasn't like, with the exception of the main event, that's the only one where they want both to really stand out. The other ones were like, hey, we're fo- kind of focusing on one dude to get them over first. The matches had heat. Well, I shouldn't say the matches had heat, but they had segments that had heat. They wanted that with James Storm and and uh, Josephus were doing. I don't like this Josephus version. I like the, the version of him with the spiritual advisor and all that. Like this, he just looks like a regular wrestler to me here. But he was someone when they, you know, when they were, you know, first kicking off the championship with Tim Storm and everything, and and they did a really good job with him too. I was, I, I thought the spiritual advisor was money, so I wish he would go back to that. I don't like, I don't like this. He just looks like a wrestler. But there was a lot of heat in that. There was heat in the, you know, because they threw a stipulation on the world title match. It wasn't just a match. I mean, next week on AEW. They say win losses matter. James uh, Chris Jericho is defending the title against the winner of uh, Jimmy Havoc and uh, Darby Darby Allen. Like, what have they done <laughs> so far in that company? You know, like it's just they're just it's just a random title shot. You know, we see it on WWE, we see it on Impact, random title shots. And we, as much as we've seen Tim Storm and Nick Aldis, they gave us a reason to care about it because they threw a stipulation on it to make the match emotional. And then the package they ran with James Storm beforehand. And then, you know, Nick Aldis, he starts the show off. Great promo. Puts all the champions over. I mean, it seems like they're, what they're trying to do is that the resp- the wrestlers, even if they don't get along, it seems like in a lot of cases they respect each other. Like Nick Aldis was making sure he, res- I, you know, I don't agree with James Storm, but I respect him, you know? So they, they kind of put that vibe out there, especially with him, with Tim Storm and everything. They want to you know elicit emotion out of people. And the focus is on the action in the ring with the commentary. I was really worried about Cornette because I don't like him on MLW. I, I stopped watching MLW fast because I didn't like him on there. But he was great on this. But the focus is 100% on the action. There's no jokes trying to be told. There's no trying to put other shit over that has nothing to do with the match. There's not one person who's trying to sound super knowledgeable about pro wrestling. You know, it felt like a sport. It felt it felt real. It did. The marketing focuses on the fan reaction. You know, they're putting out videos of fan reaction. Their their Twitter is not telling you. They're not overselling their product, saying, "Oh, this is going to be the must must watch and can't miss, and this is going to be the greatest thing you've ever seen." They didn't say that at all. They want you to make that determination for yourself. So what better way to help you along with that than, you know, posting videos of fan reactions and their engagement. The marketing is good for this shit. They, they, they're, they're just killing it. They got great people in place. It's obvious. Um, the NWA Twitter had wrote me about a year ago, uh, an NDM and told me to contact Dave Lagana and see if we could work something together, you know? Um, and that day will come for me, but I, if I'm going to send him a message, it's, I'm going to have what I, I'm going to let him know what I have to offer. You know, um, I'm no expert at anything, but I, you know, I have my education in, in business marketing, graphic design and, uh, crowd building and social media. And I have all, I have necessary experience, you know what I mean? But obviously I'm not, I'm, I'm small time. So if I step to them and say, Hey, this is what I can offer you. 
I got to have some kind of portfolio, some kind of resume. You know what I mean? But I, I get what they're doing. At least I, I hope that I do. I, I think what I'm saying, if someone was listening to what I said, I think I, I think I got a pretty clear concept of what they're doing. But I love that they don't overpromise. You underpromise, over deliver. That's how the shit works. You don't put, you know, send out a tweet with everything in caps saying this shit here, you know, you can't miss this shit here. This is the best thing, best batch you'll ever see. They just said, we hope to, you know, you give us a chance. We hope to win your viewership. And they can't, they, they do a good job coming off with an underdog story. And that's, again, that's under promising. You come off as an underdog, but when you over promise or you promise too much, or you're too confident in what you're bringing to the table, you're not an underdog. The titles come off really prestigious. What, what I like. They do. I mean, I'm going back to that. I've already talked about this a little bit. But the titles come off really prestigious, but the and the video packages that they have purpose, they have passion, they have a backstory, and then they want you to care about the talent. They're not just out there spinning their wheels. They took it back to the basics, and they clearly know their audience. They know they know their niche. It, it's clear. The opening match, you know, they say, "Hey, it's the first match here." And it's Zane and Dave Dawson. I'm not familiar with these guys. I'm not going to bullshit you. I'm not familiar with them. Squash match, minute 40 seconds long. Uh, if you blinked, you missed it. And at first I was like, they started with a squash match? But we're so used to seeing all these competitive matches week in and week out. You know, WWE, they have so much programming and no squash matches that you just see so much of the same shit when the pay-per-view rolls around. It's the same stuff, you know? There's, there's, you, it's, uh, you can't bring much to the table when you're just wrestling the same people all the time. Impact is starting to have that problem right now, especially with the knockouts. Same people are fighting each other all the time. Well, what can you bring later? Now, if you utilize squash matches and things like that properly with enhancement talent, like you're, you're getting people over and then you look forward to them being in a bigger match later. I've used this example in my Impact podcast a long time ago. Or Damian Demento in the WWF. <laughs> they, you know, I saw him wrestle a bunch of squash matches, and I thought this dude was big shit. And I think on the first episode of Raw, he was in the main event against the Undertaker, and I was like, dude, he he might beat the Undertaker. Got his fucking ass kicked, you know. And then I look back, I'm like, dude, that dude was a jobber, but you never knew it because they built him well through squash matches. They cut a promo that's super old school wrestling <laughs> after this yelling. Eli Drake. After that, he cuts his promo. Masterful. I listened to it twice. Masterful. I was really happy to see Caleb Conley in there. As I said, he he looked more important on NWA program than Impact ever did with him. So I was really happy for him because I liked him a lot. He got to showcase himself a little bit, but this was more about Eli Drake. He came off like a, a star in it. Non-title match. A non-title. You don't have to put the titles on a line all the time. You know, wild card. Uh, Thomas Latimer's Bram from TNA. They they get a squash match, um, two minutes two minutes long. They look good. They're cutting a promo after. They're having an interview. Kingston Eddie fucking Kingston comes out like this was a dude. Dude, he's so talented on the mic. He's a great talker. This is a perfect for home for him to talk. Um, he comes out, and after he says what he has to say, Homicide comes out. These people get it at NWA, folks. Homicide is. Love Homicide. Homicide's horrible on the mic. So you don't bring him out, you know, for these. Uh, uh, you, you got wild card yelling and this and this. Kingston can handle that by himself. So don't overshadow Homicide. You bring Homicide out when the it's time to get physical. You know, so that's what I'm saying. They just fucking get it. They get it. It's crazy. You can, you can just tell they sat around and just really plan this shit out. James Storm has this little thing with Josephus. That's a five-minute match. So at first, <laughs> another squash. And they even tease you a little bit. Like, they knew, you knew the last call was coming. You knew the super kick was coming. So, I don't know. It was satisfying <laughs> with everything they were doing. I don't know where you, what you do with Josephus from here. But, you know, I'm telling you, get him the spiritual advisor. That's, that's the gimmick right there. And then, NWA title match is Nick Aldis versus Tim Storm. 12-minute match. So, they get time. Tim Storm sells desperation. You know, it goes for the low blow at one point. Camille took that 
clothesline on the outside that was nasty. Whew. But you couldn't put this match on any other promotion and people would give a shit. You just couldn't. Imagine this. Uh, just pick any promotion and say, hey, they're doing Tim Storm versus Nick Aldis in the main event. How many people would give a shit? But NWN knows how to pull that off because they've built these two guys to fucking matter on their programming. And they add a stipulation to where Tim Storm is like, I don't, I, I have to win this. So if Tim Storm, he loses, he's not able to challenge again for the title. He, he did lose. Uh, finish was a little flat again <laughs> with these guys. But he lost. So I don't know if he's not allowed to challenge just Nick Aldis. I would imagine, even though they worded it like he can never wrestle for it again, I would imagine, you know, they're going to have him on the programming. I mean, he's got to comp- compete for something, right? But they've done a tremendous job with Tim Storm over the years and Nick Aldis. And so this is just a great main event to have for the for your first, you know, opening show, your debut show. And, you know, and it wasn't a five-star match, but it, but it mattered. And you don't have to do flips. You don't have to do all that bullshit. This was just great for Eli Drake, you know? You don't have to get all hardcore and do flips and wrestle chicks. Like, this is perfect for him. You just have to be just be a good wrestler and tell a story. And this is what, you know, NWA is focusing on storytelling. It's a storytelling, storytelling. Even in a five-minute squash match with James Storm, it's just storytelling. But they made the squash fun because of the brawls up to that. So NWA Power, loved it. I'm sure I'll be more critical in the future because that's, that's what I do as a podcaster, right? But I really wanted to diversify the comment with the Impact Lounge and, and cover NWA because they have a lot of former Impact talent. So I think it, you know, fits my niche audience. And I wanted to diversify what I do on the podcast, on the channel, so I can grow because there's a little bit of plateauing going on right now. So I got to think outside the box for my own brand. And NWA Power is a perfect way to do it. Thanks for tuning in, folks. I am BQ. I'll talk to you soon. Peace. <laughs>